Hey everyone, welcome to Snake News, the show where we take a look at reptiles in the headlines, minus the media venom. First up, we've got a story by the Independent newspaper. Hiker who died after being bitten by a venomous snake in Tennessee made fatal mistake, officials believe. This is a story about someone who was hiking in Savage Gulf State Natural Area, which is like a... I don't know how big it is, I think it's like a 30,000 acre national park or something, or state park. And they believe that this guy basically picked up a rattlesnake for some reason, I'm not sure why, picked up a timber rattlesnake, got bitten on the hand, then later passed away from an allergic reaction. And officials have said timber rattlesnakes typically prey on small rodents and often remain motionless if encountered in the wild. That is sometimes true, sometimes they don't rattle. Experts, or the officials rather, say, you know, don't handle them basically. Pretty simple stuff. I feel sorry for this person and their family, but on this channel I am always trying to tell people not to handle venomous snakes, especially if you don't know them that well. Next up we've got a charming article from People magazine that says, Large snake stuns mother after falling out of toy box during three-year-old's birthday party. <laughs> I love the way they say large snake. It was a, uh, it was a corn snake. You know, it's just a <laughs> smallish kind of snake. <laughs> But anyway, you know what the media does, they've got to sensationalize it. They say what you need to know in case you're terrified that this might happen in your house, which it probably never will. Um, she was cleaning up her daughter's third birthday celebration when she discovered an unwelcome guest. The Liverpool mother found a bright orange snake in an empty box that recently held one of her daughter's gifts. She called her mother for help and the pair removed the snake from the home. Then they say, I said, whose is this? Because I was thinking they haven't got a toy snake that looks like that. So only when its tongue started moving, I realized it was a real snake and I started screaming. That's just fair enough. If you're not a snake person, that's fair enough to, to scream when you get one by surprise. But this is the part of the article that gets me. It kind of shocks me. Baker's mother then heard her screams and worked with her to remove the snake from the home. So they didn't like harm the snake in any way. The mum and the grandmum got together and coerced this corn snake into a box basically and contained it. I think that's kind of cool. We've got a lot of people that keep snakes in the UK and people are kind of used to, you know, seeing headlines about snakes. They know most of it's scaremongering. This article is pretty scaremongering overall but not too bad and I think it's cool that they handled the snake without harming it. That, that shows that there are some pretty chilled out people out there. Next up we've got Mallorca Daily Bulletin. Snake sightings increase in Mallorca. Higher temperatures boost their activity and food-seeking behavior. Which is kind of a weird headline, actually. This is probably one of those magazines or uh, newspapers directed at British people that live abroad. As us Brits, when we go to another country, we typically don't learn the language and stay in close-knit communities and, and never really join in with local life. But that's another topic. Um, <laughs> But basically, there's been rising snake activity in Mallorca, it says, with two large horseshoe whip snakes that were discovered in Santa Ponsa and Santa Maria. This is where it gets interesting, though. I didn't know that the horseshoe whip snake, the ladder snake, and Montpellier snake were bought from the Iberian Peninsula, so mainland Spain. I've been to Spain and Portugal, and those species are quite common there, especially the horseshoe whip snake. I found a few of those in Portugal. And it's really interesting to me that there's invasive species problems going on with an island which is quite you know reasonably close to the mainland it's not the other side of the world like burmese pythons and florida for example so yeah i didn't know that closely related species and and kind of near species were, were causing problems with invasiveness too that that is kind of a first for me to read about and quite interesting really they say if you do spot one of the snakes, you should contact the emergency services. I guess that's to try and capture them and control the invasive ones. I'm not sure why you'd call otherwise, but it's interesting. Now we've got the FWC asks public to report sightings of rare rainbow snakes on Fox 35 Orlando. And this is quite interesting. Wildlife officials are asking the public to help track sightings of rainbow snakes, a rare non-venomous species that has declined in recent decades. This is a very beautiful species in my opinion, really interesting, interesting lifestyle and, and diet and all the rest. There's famously that subspecies of rainbow snake that was spotted once, I can't remember how long ago, it was like 50 years ago or something and never seen again, so they're, they're really curious to see whether that subspecies is still alive. 
It's, it's kind of interesting, so despite the concern, scientists have little current data on where rainbow snakes are still found in Florida. Uh, here we go. A subspecies once documented in Fish Eating Creek in Glades County has not been seen since 1952, leaving its status uncertain. They're encouraging anyone who sees a rainbow snake to report the sighting online and if possible include photographs to help confirm identification. I think that's a really great initiative. Florida has lost... <laughs> not lost so many species, but is on the edge of losing so many species to habitat degradation, habitat fragmentation, and invasive species. There's, there's just so many threats from everything from, you know, new species and their diseases arriving to new roads and draining swamps, quite frankly. Next up, we're diving into Britain's own worst shame, the depths of depravity. Um, which is the Daily Mail. And this one's about a spider, admittedly, but I thought, you know what, I've got to throw it in because it's such a good example of how the media operates. Father, 38, dies after being bitten by a venomous spider he bought online just weeks before. First of all, there's only a few genera of spider in the world that aren't venomous, so, you know, it's going to be venomous. A father reportedly died after being bitten by his own pet spider which he had purchased online just weeks before. Oh, it just shows you can't trust them. <laughs> I know I'm laughing, I'm laughing at the, the uh, magazine, I'm not laughing at the poor person that passed away. The 34 year old had become obsessed with the spiders after previously being terrified of insects, they're arachnids but whatever, his ex-partner said. She said he had complained about feeling ill but had still been playing pranks during a meal the group had at a Toby Carvery, which is like a a kind of country pub kind of deal here. Before driving back home on July 26th, he complained about flu-like symptoms, a fluctuating temperature, and aching limbs over the following week. Now, where does this article actually get interesting? I've seen a few articles, almost identical to this one, on this occurrence. Where it gets interesting is that there is no confirmed cause of death, and, you know, this is a guy who supposedly passed away a week and a half after being bitten by a spider. Most spiders, the really dangerous ones, you'd be feeling effects within six hours. Twelve hours would be, you know, maximum an infection could set in, but you'd expect to see a visible bite site infection going, leading to sepsis, perhaps. So, the likelihood of him actually dying from that spider bite, in my mind, is very, very low. The media's really jumped on this, and every article, no matter how different the publications are, says she added that owning spiders should require licenses. And that's the part I find interesting. That's what gets me suspicious. Usually between the different media outlets you see articles on a similar subject, but not with the same phrase copied and pasted in everywhere. And here in the UK, probably in the US as well, you have what you call press houses where they release a topic and an article to several media outlets and pay them to put it out. I'm not saying that's what's happened here, but I'm saying it's interesting how coordinated all these outlets have been in mentioning a ban or a license because there's a lot of people that want any kind of exotic pet to require a license. Now, finally, we're going to end the video on a positive note, <laughs> the Smithsonian Magazine article that says scientists feared the world's smallest snake had gone extinct. They just found it again, which is very, very cool. When fully grown, the Barbados thread snake is only three to four inches long, shorter than many earthworms, which is true. Thread snakes are very, very cool. Usually specialized to eat termites or ants. And that actually appears to be the correct species in the in the photo, I think. And where this article gets quite fun is um, that the guys who did the surveying to, to rediscover the species, essentially, to, to find it again, basically, one of the guys says this. He said, I was making a joke, and in my head I said, I smell a thread snake. This is Justin Springer, Caribbean program officer for Rewild, which is some organisation that I can't remember what their exact statement about the mission was. I just had a feeling, but I couldn't be sure because we turned over a lot of rocks before that and we saw nothing. And that's kind of cool because sometimes you do get a feeling about things. And something I always say is trust your gut. I can explain it, but sometimes when you're herping and you're looking for animals, you do have a feeling about a rock or something and you turn it over and there it is. And that's how I found some of the, the fun finds I've found in the past. So there you go. I hope I've demystified a little bit about how the media works, particularly in relation to reptiles. We've seen some good and bad reporting. And I will be back very soon, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, but I will be back very soon for a second episode where we debunk more of the media's devious tactics and we reward those outlets that do faithful reporting. Thank you very much.